Uh, we have a short time to uh, grill our experts on the couch. So on the couch we have, obviously, you have met Professor Gilsal from France, uh, and we have Ken Harrison beside him, who is a, a patient representative, and uh, maybe I'll let uh, Ken introduce himself uh, just a little bit and tell us his... Uh, I've story. got uh, follicular lymphoma. I got diagnosed about six months ago. I'm in one of your trials. Um, I drew standard care when the dice got thrown, so I've just finished a dose of Archop. A lot of you have been through that. And for me, I'm really excited because I'm in week four. For the last five months, all I've done is week one, week two, week three, and week one again. Now I'm in week four. So this is a good week. Because <laughs> finally made week four. Um, and in my other life, I happen to be a doctor. My specialty is in trauma medicine, and I know nothing about, or I knew nothing about um, lymphoma or cancers other than as an anaesthetist, I occasionally got to put lines and things in people, but on that, I knew nothing till six months ago. And uh, obviously we have Professor Wummel from Germany, and I uh, would like to introduce you to Judith Trotman, Professor Trotman, who is uh, from here at Concord, who is an expert in her own right, and is uh, very instrumental in getting today together. <laughs> so, uh, and I insisted that she take the couch as an expert and, uh, and uh, give us the benefit of her knowledge, um, but also to thank her for the great effort she had in uh, putting today together. So uh, I think it's been fantastic so far. Let's uh, get on. Now, we do have a slight problem. Uh, the overwhelming uh, interest in today has overwhelmed our... Uh, our audio system and our microphones have uh, started to fatigue, unfortunately. So uh, I would like, if uh, you have a question, to uh, either come down to the side and uh, let me know your question and I'll relay it. We do have people listening online, so it's very important that all, uh, all everything that we say goes through, either the microphone that I am on here or the microphone that the couch panel has. So I will be happy to repeat your questions. If you don't feel comfortable walking down to the side, just um, maybe indicate, and I will repeat the question for the purposes of people listening online. Now, I would be very interested just to start, maybe, uh, Professor uh, Rommel, as to what, uh, what came out of interest in your breakout session. Uh, were there, was there a particular theme or a particular point that uh, people were very interested in that you'd like to bring forward for the rest of the group? Was it Waldenstrom disease? <coughs> there were very specific questions because on the one hand it's like a low-grade lymphoma, however it has very specific aspects. We were discussing best treatment approaches, retreatment with one or the other treatment, and specific side effects of the treatments and also the future, how the treatment recommendations would look like in the next year or in the next five years. So it was very um, good question from experienced patients and of patients with a very high level of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And if I can briefly ask the same question of Professor Saul in uh, his session, and then we'll ask for questions from the floor. So we, we had a, a broader spectrum of disease and situations uh, from questions related to watch and wait, uh, when do we start treatment, what's the efficiency of treatment, the efficacy of treatment when started after watch and wait, treatment of relapse and also lifestyle during treatment, uh, food and uh, all the lifestyle uh, issues. So I think we have uh, many very diverse questions and answers. And I'm not sure we covered everything, but uh, that's for the next visit in Australia. <laughs> so um, I was in the high grade session um, with Dr. Butler, and we had a similar range of lifestyle questions. But I think one of the interesting points that was brought up is the side effects of prednisone and steroids for people who are on it. And although it's not a chemotherapy agent, it definitely has side effects that uh, people find. Uh, quite concerning and distressing at times, and uh, it was good to acknowledge that um, and uh, remind people of that. Uh, does anyone have a question? We do have a microphone now that's functional that we can get to a member in the audience. Uh, Bernie, I happen to know your name. This is to Professor Sal. Um, I just understand your slide from the clinical trial that was, the trial only was for grade one two patients. Is there a reason why the one grade three patients I think that's what Professor Roman, but 
That's all right. <laughs> so we included only follicular grade one and two. We excluded three. The reason for that is grade three is maybe a different kind of disease. It's not so precisely defined as grade one and two. So in the textbook of hematology, grade one and two is one disease. Grade three starts to become a little bit a different disease. And in order to be very homogeneous in our result and in our result um, expression, we wanted to um, limit the inclusion criteria on a very precise defined patient population. In the end, it is very arbitrary. You could also have done it with grade 3A, but that is how we did it. And retrospectively, we don't know if it was good or bad decision. It was like it is. Anyone else? Just Maybe just to add a very small comment on that. Um, diseases are not all the same all over the world. And probably in the United States, the way grade three are diagnosed may be a little bit different from Europe. I don't know about Australia. And our colleagues in, in the US have repeatedly found that treatment of grade three follicular lymphoma with CHOP was good. So I, I, I think there may be a little bit differences between the biology of grade one and two and grade three. And within grade three. Yeah, and 3A versus 3B. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. Just not, sorry, just with our microphone up there. No, no. My question is about the um, energy levels and the correlation with the lymphoma. With the um, lack of fatigue indicates improvements in, um, or, um, or the lymphoma is going away or any sort of correlation whatsoever. Anyone on the panel have a thought? Uh, with my study of N on one, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, like in every kind of this, this kind of disease, uh, if people feel better, it's usually favourable. And if people have a lack of energy, it can be related to treatment and uh, tolerability of treatment or to the disease. However, sometimes treatment can be harmful and decrease the rate of energy and well-being but you have to pass through that. So it's not necessarily a bad sign. So I think it can be taken either way. So with the treatment of pendamustin, 30% of the patients experience fatigue lasting one week after the treatment. And that has nothing to do with efficacy or no efficacy. That is my experience, but I realize with the treatment of bendamustin, fatigue is common in 30% of the patient. Probably that's much more than with CHOP. I don't know really what is the fatigue in CHOP, but it's a specific bendamustin associated symptoms, one week lasting. I think also perhaps speaking particularly about CHOP, um, the fatigue that patients often experience with CHOP, uh, often if the patient has been started uh, with the CHOP every two weeks and they get significant fatigue, um, that may be a good rationale for them to reduce the frequency to CHOP every three weeks. And we won't go into the debate over the two-week versus three-weekly treatment of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but that is often an option that um, some patients would consider. However, once I think the most important thing about fatigue is discussing it with your doctor. And once you're reassured that that is unfortunately a, a normal consequence of the therapy, um, and that for the most part, but not always, it completely resolves after the therapy is over. I think when I offer many of my patients the option of you know, slowing down the therapy, they say, oh no, I'll just head on, head down, and get through it, thanks. Mm -hmm. We have a lady with a mic. Um, uh, so far, we always talk about longevity with um, response to ARCHO, and this process of elimination, I can see. So the first treatment we do our job and then sixty percent of the will be and another twenty percent will do the bone marrow and the will be What happens if you are the last five percent that doesn't recover? How important it is to find out what's your sub five of your um, cancer cell in the first place before any treatment? 
Because also, that's very important in a fish test. When you find out what's your subtype in the first place, then when you're in the final 5% of those that doesn't respond to the treatment, what do you do? So we, we know in many diseases like uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that the technology is uh, telling us that not all diffuse B-cell lymphoma, for example, are the same and that uh, some people have a slightly different genetic profile and need uh, their disease needs to be treated differently. Would um, one of the panel like to talk, talk to that? So that is what we describe on very... Um, blank numbers on the slides. That sounds very easy to understand, but in real life it's very different when you belong to the numbers, which is not 100%. And so I just mentioned in our, my trial it was 92 and 91%, and I said it's a good response. But still on the other side around, it's 8 or 9% of patients having a problem. And unfortunately we have many ideas, as Jill Sal explained to you by the biology and different genetics, but at the moment now, unfortunately, we cannot predict who responds ex um, very good and excellent and who does not respond very good. So you always have to react when you don't achieve a good treatment result. You have to change the treatment plan and again to change your treatment plan. That is always reaction on what happened. Yes, that's, uh, I would like to answer it a little bit um, philosophical. It only is good when you know what to do with the result. <laughs> if you don't do what you do with, if you have lymphoma type 1 and 2 and both are treated the same way, it probably makes you nervous. And that's not helpful. It's helpful for the science and when we collect this data in a clinical trial that we learn but outside of a clinical trial, when you do routine treatment, probably I would not look if the patient has an ABC or GZB type lymphoma because they are all treated the same, despite the fact that I know in my heart it's different. And we also have trials available for some of these situations, so to look for a clinical trial that might be relevant to that would be very important as well. But, but what you're saying, it's quite, it's very worrisome as a patient. You're looking up on the net and one of the numbers on your piece of paper comes up as like a bad thing and another one comes up like a good thing and you think, am I in the good one or am I in the bad one? You know, where am I going to be? So I utterly agree with you about sometimes too much information ain't a good thing. I think the other part of that question was, should you know before you start treatment? In, um, in some, of, some countries, I'm, I'm assuming Germany, it may be possible to get some of these test results back before you need to start treatment. But um, sometimes those tests are time consuming and they take a little while. And sometimes because of the clinical need of the patient, we have to start treatment before we know the genetic testing results. But then the doctor will advise if a change needs to be made um, or if you should continue on the treatment that you started. Uh, so that does happen, in just the reality of the timing of the need of the patient to start something because they're very unwell and the time it takes to get the results back. Mm. Perhaps I can add there, Jane, that particularly with the aggressive lymphomas, we're getting a much better sense of the bad lymphomas and the very bad lymphomas, so to speak. Um, and as we get the sense when the tests come back, after we've started treatment, that someone has a very bad lymphoma. We're then faced with the dilemma um, that Professor Rummel brought up, that if the standard treatment is, is CHOP or CHOP-like approach, you know, what is the next best treatment for these very bad patients? Because while you know, some single institution data suggests that a very intensive chemotherapy approach may be better, we don't have that gold standard, large, randomised clinical trial data uh, to support that. So, you know, it's a good thing or a bad thing. You know, we're always finding our limitations all the time. And so working on trying to, you know, adapt to those limitations and advance uh, the field of lymphoma management. Mm -hmm. uh, our microphone, Jim. Um, Boss, going to 
uh, I understand the problem of uh, the risk of contracting hysteria. Uh, when having completed our job and going on to the Tuxedo maintenance, uh, is the risk of hysteria still the same, or can I enjoy seafood and cheeses? And <laughs> Uh, the risk of infections. Listeria. Ah, listeria. Oh. Well, I think listeria is, is bad even when you don't receive our job, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it is, but it, 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 is, is, is the risk of contracting listeria the same just when you're touching that as it is when you're having our job? Well, um, I, I have to, to say something. Um, if we looked specifically at the six months after our job, whether patients had maintenance or not, we have almost similar rate of infections. So you have to be careful when you are nearby the, the end of the, of the chemo. Sorry, I was there. Uh, but I, I, I won't ask my patients to prevent to eat oysters as long as they are fresh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, however, regarding maintenance with rituximab, it does increase the rate of infection, which has usually ear, nose infections, bronchitis, or very common infections that are usually treated with antibiotics. What I advise to physicians and patients is that if it's repeated, and if patients undergo this kind of infection like two, three times in six months, they should first check the immune status with immunoglobulin levels. That's just a serum test easy to do. And eventually, especially in more elderly population, stop maintenance because the long-term life benefit is not demonstrated. It's, an, it's, it's a delay of recurrence, but it's not necessarily a prolongation of the expectation of life. So if there are too many side effects, you better stop it. Uh, my question is to Professor Rommel. Uh, in, I was in a warm and strong breakout session, and I was particularly interested in your comment about investigative driven clinical trials. I, I think I've denoted a sense of pride when you said my trial was an investigative driven trial. Um, and my question really is. I don't think in Australia we have any investigative driven trials. Oh, <laughs> we sure do. <laughs> I think there's a sense of pride in Australia with our investigative driven trials as well. Uh, so obviously I've uh, opened up uh, an interesting question. But, uh, in Europe, uh, in, in Germany, is, is it farm driven predominantly? And one of the things that you a very key point was that if, if it's investigative driven, that uh, you have the right to, to do the follow-ups five years later, ten years later, and, and that's uh, obviously, uh, as a patient, uh, seems to be a very good way of going. Most studies, by far the most studies in Germany are pharmaceutical driven, as always around the world. Also, I would speculate that in Australia, some investigator-initiated trials are present and are running. But most studies come from the pharmaceutical industry because they want to develop new drugs, new medication, new treatment strategies. And the studies are very, very um, time-consuming, money-consuming, and very lot of effort is necessary to do it. So from that point, it appears to be clear that investigator initial trials are very, very few only because a lot of work which is needed to be done is mostly covered by the pharmaceutical companies with, with their huge staff of people working on it. The pharmaceutical companies also, drugs ran out of patent after X numbers of years. So they don't like 10 year follow ups because they want to be able, the drug will have run out of paint by the time, you know, so they've got a problem. Um, maybe two pieces of comment regarding this very interesting question. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned regarding clinical trials, clinical trials cost a lot of money. And you are a group of patients, you are supporting advocacy for patients, 
So you should support public funding for clinical trials because one of the issues we have both in France and Germany and Australia, and I'm sure, is that given shortage, shortage, shortage sorry, of public money to run investigator-initiated trial by our university or institution or National Cancer Institute, we run less and less of this investigator-initiated trial. That's true. Um, Besides the pharma industry, um, as cooperative group, we sometimes run trial in partnership with industry. In our group, uh, we have two conditions. Is first, we design the trial, and we uh, are insisting on some questions and so on. And I should say that the clinical trial, which was called Prima, in which both uh, my, my two Australian colleagues here participated uh, actively, uh, was supported by the industry, but by when initiated with investigators. We had meetings with investigators during international conferences to design that. Uh, the database is in the hands, not of the industry, but in the hands of academics, and that's the reason we are able to do long-term follow-up. This is the same for relevance. Even if the company is very interested in the result, the database is in the hands of the academics. So we need to continue to define partnership with industry that is interested in running trials and developing drugs, but in which us as academic still maintain also our interest, and that's the way we should go, I think. Just one comment. Also, the study which we have done is investigator initial trials are supported by pharmaceutical companies. So as Jill Sal said, the idea, the plan comes from the clinicians. The data is in the hand of clinicians but without any money, you could not do the study. So you need somebody. And fair enough, the pharmaceutical industry are supporting it when it's a good study and a good question. Look, I th no, look, Andrew, it's, it's wonderful you asked this question because it gives us the opportunity to you know, really discuss um, what are effectively industry supported but not sponsored, not run by industry trials uh, through the cooperative groups. And I, in Australia, um, we do run our own studies through the Australian Leukemia Lymphoma Group, but we also, you know, Australia is a very small country, all right? It is not a big country. We only have our 25 million people. I'm a New Zealander, a very proud New Zealander, and we have, you know, four million there. And the, Australasian, the Australian New Zealand Leukemia Lymphoma Group, we band together and we collaborate with the French Lymphoma Group, with the German Lymphoma Groups, with the um, Italian, with the English Lymphoma Groups to work together in designing the trials that answer the questions we really want to answer. And then if that is a trial that involves uh, a, an agent that has been developed by industry, then we will go to industry or be approached by industry and talk with them. You know, we do have to have an eyes wide open, very mature relationship with industry if we are going to develop these, these agents. But we need to do it on our terms and our patients' terms. Um, and I think that's, that's very important. Excellent, well covered. Question from the back? Yeah, thank you. As someone who is diagnosed with follicular lymphoma at age 40, I find it very difficult to find a lot of information, especially for a, as a male, on where to get some research stuff. Follicular lymphoma is generally regarded as a young disease or an old disease. Where do I fall into it and what does the panel have in the future for people like myself. Yes, so that is true what you are describing. It's a rare disease in younger patient populations. The typical age in average is 60, and then you have a 10% distribution beyond and below 60 years. So with 40 years, you are indeed very young. But we all see the young patients, and typically we have more or less the same um, strategy in our mind when treating a patient who is 60 years old. Of course, you have a very long strategy in your mind because you want to cover also the next 10, 20 years, 30 years, 
And so you would like to make the decision on the first-line treatment so that it does not restrict second- and third-line treatment if you ever need it. Sure. Well, I, I, I don't have uh, much to add. I think um, uh, large clinical trials li like ours do allow sometimes to analyze the subset of very young patients or very old patients, so both spectrum. And uh, yes, we, we, we find sometimes interesting features of that. What, what, what I should say is that at the present time, we don't feel that the biology is markedly different, but it may differ a little bit in younger patients as compared to the medium age, um, and, and, and histology also may differ a little bit. Efficacy of treatment doesn't appear to differ. What I should say regarding age is that it's not true that lymphoma are more aggressive in younger. There are some subtypes very aggressive that are found in younger ones, but it's not more aggressive because you are young, and it's not more indolent because you are 75. Um, there are different diseases on country at different time of life, but for the same disease, exactly the same occurring, it's not more aggressive in younger and more uh, less aggressive in elderly or vice versa. Uh, do we have a microphone out there? I think we have a question. Can, can I ask a question? Can I ask yep. a question of Ken and declare that I'm his doctor? All right. <laughs> now, now, be a bit gentle, Ken, but perhaps on behalf of all the patients, you know, what advice would you give to doctors treating patients with lymphoma? <coughs> I think uh, I, I think the one thing that you've all covered, which I found really good, is that we are all individuals. Sounds a bit like Monty Python, but we are. Um, and uh, and you've all covered that in all your answers, which has been fantastic. I think the other thing is is that there is just so much stuff on the net that even as a doctor, admittedly, is one who knows nothing about lymphoma, it can be incredibly comforting one evening and frightening the next evening depending upon what you're looking at and all the rest of it. So please be aware we're all going to raise a whole heap of silly questions because of what we've been talking about in the last little while. You know, and you know, you've only got to, we've all got complete access to the net these days. And there's a lot that even I as a doctor don't understand about what's written there that either makes me feel great one night or awful the next night. You know, so please be aware of that. Um, and the other thing, and again, I suspect we're preaching to the converted here, but, but it is great the changes that are happening, um, and, uh, and it, you know, it is great that there are so many new treatments and so many other things that are happening, but I think we, um, we want to, whilst we want to be presented with lots of alternatives, we also want to be you know, kind of guided as to what we should be doing and what you guys think is appropriate for us once you've treated us as individuals. Um, my own, the only other thing I would say, and again, I think I'm preaching converted is I really want to say if you can possibly get yourself as a patient into a clinical trial in any way, me, shape or form, do it for all the reasons that you say beforehand. You know? Consider it. Consider it. Okay. Okay. Consider it. But, but you know, seriously think about whether you can do it, you know, for your sake, because you will get better treatment, and for the sake of whoever's coming along in the next generation. Ken, can I ask a question, because I don't know you, and I'm not sure. a treating doctor. What was um, confronting or reassuring about being presented with a clinical trial protocol as a, as a patient? Yeah, well, being on the other side of the clinical trial protocol than what I've been on in the past, um, first of all, the pages of things that could go wrong, um, you know, like pages of them. Um, and I, I, being a doctor, all I could say is, yeah, okay, well, I've got to get used to this, yes. Um, the other thing that was confront, uh, one of the other things that was confronting about it was just the protocol that said, you know, you will, you will do this, then you will spit sideways, then you will do this, then you will take four steps backwards, then you will take you know, the, all the bits that you're doing. Um, but on the other hand, that has been, that, that when I think about it a bit more, that is actually reassuring because 
much as I think Judith is great, it's not Judith who has come up with this protocol. It is a bunch of experts from around the world that have come up with the best possible treatment of the minute. And what we know about treating anything from heart attacks to traumas to everything these days is that when I was training, I was told, you're the doctor, you make the decisions, you decide on a patient. What we know now is if you get the best people together to decide on a protocol, you will do better if that protocol is followed than if one particular doctor, no matter how good they, she or she is, will make that decision. So that's one of the things that I'm thinking about it that was really worthwhile. Um, and, the, uh, and, and the other thing is just there are more, yes, there are more blood tests, yes, there are more things, yes, there are more things to do. But there's someone to, you know, I've got a Sylvia. And, you know, <laughs> Sylvia, basically, if there's an issue, you ring up Sylvia and Sylvia takes care. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she's the best PA I've ever met. <laughs> yeah. So Sylvia, for those who don't know, is one of our clinical it, trials. She's, she's one of the coordinators, you know, and she's, yeah. yeah. I, I, just coming back to your first point regarding information, um, I think I'm facing many people involved in Australia lymphoma uh, patients group. I think um, what you are doing is really great. I haven't logged into your web page, but getting information by a patient group with eventually advice by scientific advisor, which are probably sitting in this room and sharing this meeting is really, really important. And it provides to the patient a place where you can find uh, logical and yes. pertinent yes. information and instead of leaving patients running in different pages and everywhere saying everything I think it provides rational objective information and I think you have to be uh, um, encouraged to continue to do that and uh, uh, I think all patients should acknowledge uh, that this is very good for all the community of patients also, I want to say <clears throat> that we don't have to overstress that point with the clinical trials because we cannot come to the point that patients feel disappointed and feel a disaster if they cannot go into a clinical trial. The standard treatment also is good when you go to an experienced um, department and um, when you go with a frontline treatment of a nodal marginal zone, Probably there is no study available, and one should not be disappointed. But the question and the message is what we want to say. If there is a choice of a clinical trial, one has to consider as a slide, and Judy Trotman says it is a good question, it is management, manageable, and so on, and then you don't be too afraid to go into the trial. But in reality, it is the exemption that one can do it. Could I ask, while you still have the microphone, what uh, percentage of patients in your practice would go on to a clinical trial? So in my centre we have all kinds of hematological diseases. We had treat acute leukaemias. Probably 70% of acute leukaemias are within a clinical trial. We treat MDS, probably 2% MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome, a different disease, probably only 2% or 1% is in a trial because there are no trials offered for that kind of patient and the disease is too heterogeneous. We have low-grade lymphomas. The vast majority is in the trial. We have multiple myelomas, maybe 10%. We have Hodgkin patient, 100% are in the trial. <laughs> but that has something to do with the local circumstances, with the local opportunities, and the German Hodgkin group is absolutely strong and highly accepted, and there is no good German MDS group on the other hand, so you have extreme chances. No chance to go into the trial, or you have to go, because you have Hodgkin's disease, and every German Hodgkin patient is treated in a trial. Can, can I just emphasize that's why we in New South Wales have got together and we send patients around, and this is happening in Victoria, all around Australia now effectively. We are sending our patients, we are recommending to them that you go and you participate in this or consider. You know, there's informed consent and there's also informed dissent. And I say to some of my patients, I would like you to consider this trial because I think that is the best way of delivering the best effective therapy to you and I think you should go to the hospital down the road and patients are coming to us and it's been an amazing cultural change 
where where the silos are coming down. And I think that's just an absolutely wonderful thing because, you know, we've talked a lot about diffuse large cell lymphoma, we've talked a lot about follicular lymphoma, but there are 30 different types of lymphoma, or however many you can count, you know, and we don't have a trial in every hospital for every patient. Um, I think we've run out of time for questions uh, with the group and people need to be going. Uh, I don't know. Sure, yes. <laughs> Um, perhaps I can repeat it for you if you like. Because he's a clinical trial participant, he's allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> no favouritism. No, we were very emotional, guys, and I started to cry. <laughs> but it's not, it's not a, a question from for an answer. It's a because we've been talking tonight about this is so controlled by it. Oh, mine is the one of gratitude of our three professors down there and also my wife here. You can say good for me. I've got four of us. I've diagnosed with visual uh, lymphoma. Now, I'm 37. I run a bike about 80 kilometers a week. I walk a lot with my wife. I've got tap on possibly that tap. So we went to see Dr. Proctor and had she diagnosed it with what I had. And only last Monday, her words, I'm repeating her words, my lymphoma has melted away. So thank you once again. you're on the other side of the trial that uh, Ken is on and so we have to thank Professor Saal and all his colleagues in France for designing this excellent study uh, and I think I'm very hopeful that all our international collaborations will continue so that you can all be a part of you know, delivery of world-class care locally. So I'd like to thank our... Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank our international guests. Uh, It's been a real uh, delight having both of you and hearing your wisdom. Uh, Now, Professor Rommel, I hear you have a a secret connection to Australia as an athlete that we weren't aware of. Would you like to divulge your secret? (laughs) Yes, I um, explained to the people I met first (coughs) that I looked down in my cellar in the very last corner to see if I have still this famous Australian T-shirt because when I was younger I was a sportsman and I was traveling to many countries as a member of a national team and I found this one Australian t-shirt from 1985. It survived and I took it with me and I showed it some people and they found it very um, nice because... Um, <laughs> He's a modern yeah, that was the way, as you see it in the TV, when the, after the football games, the people exchanged their jackets and their suits, and that was the same what we were doing, and that was Australia 1985, and I was in these days a modern pentathlete, which is horseback riding, fencing, shooting, swimming, and running. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I think that's a really important message to finish on. There is life outside lymphoma. (laughs) (laughs) And it's lovely to have you in the country of the green and gold and, uh, and sharing with us today. So thank you very much and we'll close for the day.